It's Terry Bradshaw from the UVM fruit team uh, down here at Sunrise Orchards in Cornwall, Vermont during bloom and uh, standing next to some kind of traditional, what we call freestanding central leader trees. I'll take a step off for me and just show them out. Uh, I don't know exactly what the rootstock and variety is on this. I'm gonna guess this is probably about an M26, modeling 26. Uh, these are probably Macintosh, um, and you can see, well, well, first we'll talk about the tree structure. So we'll look at the structure and we'll see the central trunk, one trunk, uh, and this is a really well pruned kind of classic example of such a style. Uh, central trunk where you have scaffold limbs that radiate out from there that support the fruit. And remember these blossoms will become the fruit. So you've got a strong trunk that supports the weight of a large crop. Now this bloom is a little bit sparse. Um, you can see that, you know, there's a lot of blank spots in the canopy. Uh, you know, it's not a, a, a particularly heavy bloom. So I would say this is gonna be kind of a, a lighter crop for the year. Um, we'll walk down through these rows a little bit more and see some of the differences here. We can see in this case, we've got a smaller tree right next to a larger tree. I suspect that this larger tree may be scion rooted and the scion rooting is what happens when you have the top, the variety of the tree is called the scion grafted to the rootstock. And if the tree settles after you plant it and the scion is below ground and the scion sets roots, you will lose the dwarfing effect of the rootstock. And sometimes if you see a row like this, where all of a sudden you got a bigger tree that pops up, uh, it's an indication that you may have some scion rooting going on. Uh, so I, that's what that looks like to me. I may be wrong, but it's quite possible. We'll keep looking in through here, uh, walking through. What I really wanted to get to and to show you was this next row over. Uh, I these trees and again, I'm not absolutely sure what they are, but they sure look like empire to me just by the branch angle and the structure of the trees. And you see how this bloom is this is what we would call almost a snowball bloom kind of wall to wall white um, much greater potential for crop production on a uh, on a bloom like this. So you can see some real varietal differences um, and that's not uncommon to have that um, as opposed to you know, these trees that we're seeing almost no bloom. Um, and so the job of a grower is to take, this is too many blooms. If every one of these apples, if every one of these blossoms was to set and turn into a fruit, we would have too many fruit. Those fruit would be too small. We would create too much stress on the tree. And in about a month or so, next year's fruit buds, blossom buds will be forming. So next year's fruit, form this year. And so if we overstress the tree by not removing some of these blossoms or the fruit that come from these blossoms, um, we'll get this biennial bearing habit. Um, and you'll have poor quality, small fruit as a result. So this is not a bad thing. Uh, the grower will probably come through here and thin the crop uh, after bloom or maybe even during bloom. Um, and that's a way to kind of adjust the hormone uh, balance in the tree that tricks the tree into thinking there's either too many fruits or maybe that the photosynthetic rate is too low to support those fruit and it causes some of those fruit to drop. It's a very, very common practice um, and I would even say a necessary practice that's done. Um, but I still wanna kind of get a sense because we're gonna look at, so, uh, at a more uh, modern dwarfing system that's a very different structure. So I'm gonna come back around we're talking about systems still here. Um, Freestanding central leader See that, that central trunk that your limbs radiate out from. Um, the tree is held up by a lot of lumber. A lot of wood is holding that tree up. And yes, we have a tremendous amount of, of, of fruit potential, right? With all these blossoms. But if we were to look down at this from a, from a high level and look at the architecture of the orchard and look at the spatial uh, layout of the orchard, we might notice that um, there's a whole lot of this tree, the center, where there's no fruit production or very little fruit production. And you'll also notice that's in the shade. Uh, and so, yes, we can produce high uh, yields. In fact, in this orchard during other research projects, I've measured 1,000, 1,200 bushels per acre, which is, is as good as you'll see in 
even the most modern orchards in New England. Um, but most of the time I'd say you might get about 700, 800 bushels per acre, um, which is not bad, and, um, but it's not as high as you could get. One of the other things about this is if you were to imagine a tree, if you were to, to you know, so one of the sayings can be that what's up is also what's down, meaning, you know, a big tree like this has also got a big, uh, resilient, kind of anchored, structured root stock, root system, um, which also means that this tree is going to be fairly resilient to things like drought stress, uh, to potentially cold damage because it's got a strong set of roots. Um, and that's one of the benefits to this type of system uh, that we're starting to see as we have more issues with climate change and some insect pests that, that cause damages to trunks, uh, particularly small tender trunks. So I'm not writing off this system, um, but it is very different. And we'll see when we look over at the, at the other system, the distribution of the blossoms, the distribution of the fruit within the canopy can be very different. Uh, but I'll just leave with this shot of just an absolutely fabulous bloom on um, what I believe to be an empire, probably on about M26 semi-dwarfing rootstock. So here we are just across the road from the larger freestanding central leader trees that we were looking at before. This is a modern high density uh, tall spindle system. So this variety is Macowan. Uh, and you can see this is just gorgeous in terms of uh, the blossoms, uh, the tree form, um, everything is kind of lined up right. You got a nice bee doing its thing there. It's always great to see those. Um, this block was planted, don't quote me, but I want to say maybe 2014, 2015. So this is about five years old. Um, Macowan is a fairly um, low vigor tree. So these are a little bit smaller. We'll step over a row and you'll see a more vigorous uh, tree under this system. But the thing to look at is just look at the absolute uniformity of this planting. Um, all the trees are of, of a very similar uh, um, size, distribution of uh, fruit buds, uh, blossoms now. Uh, and um, you can see it's just a wall of blossoms. It'll eventually be a wall of fruit. A very narrow canopy, you know, I can reach through here, you know, our canopy is only about three feet deep. And that's really important because as we looked at with the freestanding central leader trees, the interior of the tree uh, could be six feet from the outside of the tree. The, whole, the, the total tree might be 12 feet wide, 10, 12 feet wide, um, which means that the interior of the tree gets shaded. Whereas in this situation, there's no shading anywhere in the tree. Um, the other thing that's different is none of the limbs are old. All the all of these fruiting, these shoots are young wood, maybe, maybe three years old, but most of it's probably about two years old. This system is designed such that you're growing fruit buds and fruiting wood instead of vegetative wood or lumber, right? Um, because we build these trellises, these very rugged systems, you know, with pressure treated poles bamboo wires to train the trees against, multiple high tensile wires. Um, these are highly engineered. Um, this is a fabulous trellis. This is like a Cadillac of trellises. Um, and we do that so that the tree does not have to waste energy and waste time growing a trunk to hold up the tree and to hold up the crop. Now you can build the trunk. You build this system, train the tree up, and then the wood that you do grow can be this young kind of juvenile, or it's not really juvenile, but it's um, young, highly productive fruiting wood. So apples like to fruit, uh, apples fruit on two year old wood. So in two to three year old wood, by the time it gets four or five years old, the fruiting potential declines. So these trees will, none of these limbs are permanent. The only thing that's permanent is that trunk. And you'll see these little stubs like I have here. Um, you constantly, when a shoot gets, you know, to say the size of this one, uh, next year we would take this whole shoot off and let this one come in. It'll look like this next year, do its fruit, take that off. Now this one comes out and we're constantly turning over and regenerating the canopy. Uh, and you get this consistent narrow alley. Um, it's easier to, um, uh, harvest, do any labor within this. Yeah, there might be a thousand trees per acre, um, but
but to, to prune this tree, right? Look at this tree or any of these trees, you know, will take seconds, literally. Um, whereas to prune, you know, one of the larger trees might take 10 minutes, um, in which case you're doing six trees an hour. Um, and you might have 200 trees per acre, um, still six trees per hour. That's, that's taking, you know, days per acre as opposed to acres per day. Um, harvest is much easier here. Um, there's, you know, you don't have, if you are using ladders, you're just popping bam, bam, bam right down through the orchard. Um, this also allows for mechanization. So there are um, harvest platforms where it's basically a self-driving tractor and a person might be perched on a, on a station about this high and they just travel real slowly, you know, one mile an, eight, an hour or less. The whole platform travels down and they can harvest these tops. The bin might be right behind them. They just pick them straight into the bin. Um, ergonomically much safer, uh, much better for, um, you know, productivity. Um, so there's a, this is really is a high efficiency uh, system. It's also a high input system. And that's one of the downsides of it. Um, these systems work well if um, everything is works right. Um, but you'll notice there's all these tender trunks, right? There's 1,200 trunks per acre. None of the trunks are allowed to get very large because we're not growing big lumber to hold the tree up. We're building the trellis. So each of those trunks is at a size that if we were to have voles, which is uh, a type of field mouse, to get established in here and start eating those trunks, you could lose entire sections of orchard very easily. Um, bark boring beetles uh, can become a problem when you have these young tender trunks, as opposed to the older trees where, you know, the same voles or beetles might come in, um, but you've got so much less tissue that's at this young age susceptible to damage. Um, also notice the herbicide strip here. Um, these young trees have got a very shallow root system. And so you need to provide them with drip irrigation. You can see the drip irrigation here. Um, there's usually fertilizers that are put directly into the water. You're basically spoon feeding these trees and there's really no room for grass or other uh, uh, ground cover to out compete, uh, to, to compete with the trees. Um, so, you know, it becomes more critical for every one of these uh, management practices to be followed to ensure you get high output um, from the high input that you put into it. I just switched over a row and I just want to uh, point out a different variety. This is, this is Portland, a much more bigger variety than McAllen. Um, and you can see how this grows a little bit differently. It really fills up, you know, the, to the top of the trellis and that trellis is, you know, a good 14 feet up, um, goes right to the top. You can also see a difference in tree form. So Cortland is known to be a tip bearer. So you'll see a long blind piece of what we call blind wood. So there's no, no development. There's nothing on that wood. There'll be some leaves later on, but even not a lot of those. Everything comes out at the end. That's what Cortland does. It's just a habit of, of Cortland. Makes it kind of miserable to, to prune and manage. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to keep sort of in the system that you have here. You know, you've, you've given each tree a certain box that it can grow in. Um, Cortland is pretty easy for it to grow itself outside the box. And that's another damage uh, or another uh, potential issue with these systems is the trees can overgrow the space you give them. So Cortland can be tricky with that. On the flip side, back to the McAllen, less vigorous, you give it a certain box and it may not even fill the box, right? That space between these two trees is wasted acreage. You know, if you multiply that across the orchard, you would like to see these trees just starting to touch each other, right? Here's back to the Cortland. Um, and so these systems can be a little tough to optimize. You know, this is really um, a lot more farming by science. Um, and there's still a fair amount of art to it because there's so many different things to think about. The rootstock you select, um, these have to be done, done on dwarfing rootstocks, but which dwarfing rootstock? There's a lot of different uh, ones out there. What variety? How do you manage the nutrients to get enough growth? Um, but to not have too much growth. Um, you know, how is the soil? You know, all these systems, these are planted worldwide on lots of different types of soils. How is your soil going to uh, respond or how are the trees going to respond to your particular soil? So there's a lot of different bits and pieces you've got to think about. And there's a lot of money on the line. You know, these systems 
I've already mentioned this, about $25,000 to plant one acre of these trees, um, as opposed to the older freestanding system that I could plant an acre of those for 4,000 bucks. So for, you know, a fifth of the price. Um, but high risk, high reward. We'll go back over on the other side of the hedgerow, the freestanding central leader trees, probably 30, 40 years old. They've bought and paid for themselves a long time ago. Um, but a good question is, what's the future going to be? Is it going to be this system that shows that it can produce and pay for itself, but might tie you to a variety that 30 years down the road is only fetching a third of the price it used to fetch? Or is it going to be this system that allows you to change over varieties quickly? You know, these will produce fruit in three years. These will produce fruit in eight to 10 years. And what if what happens if in eight to 10 years, the price of that variety drops? So with this other system, we can, you know, really adapt to changing markets, but it's expensive to play that game. Uh, you know, to, to establish an orchard like this, you don't just go in and go out. Um, you've really got to do your math, do your homework, uh, and then do your management. You really uh, need to stay on top of things. And this is a fabulously well-managed, uh, you know, high density, tall spindle system where they really are doing all the management. You know, meanwhile, across the road, I'm not saying this isn't well-managed, um, but again, there's a certain resiliency that uh, exists within these types of systems where, you know, you can certainly weed pressure is a, is a whole different, it's not that weed pressure doesn't exist, but it's a very different scale um, to where a lot of growers just let the grass grow to the trunks and mow it. Um, you know, pruning, you might prune these once every year or two or three. Um, three is kind of the, 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 the maximum end of pushing it. Whereas with this system, um, every year, no matter what, you've got to stay on top of these things. Um, and so, yeah, the labor for what you do do takes less time per, certainly per tree and potentially per acre, but there's a lot more things to do. So, um, like anything, you know, there's a balance. Um, I don't think there's any one answer. Some people really do think there there's camps out there <coughs> that consider this the only way to move forward and that consider this the only way to, um, stay viable for the long, long term. Um, one's more ecological, one's more economical. Um, I think that there's a balance between those. And, um, you know, we're going to see as we move forward, a combination just like in this orchard, which provides me a perfect example of a way to compare and contrast the two systems um, to look at uh, what the apple industry or what the tree fruit industry is going to look like as we move ahead. So I'll just cut back and maybe walk down through. Um, it's another tall spindle system. Heirloom tree. So this is an interesting one. Um, we're taking old antique varieties. Esipus Spitzenberg, for example, 2016. So this is a four year old block. Um, Dabinet, that's a variety that's hundreds of years old from uh, England, grown for hard cider production but growing it on a modern, you know, high density trellis system. So maybe that's the answer. Ellis Bitter, another old, oldish uh, cider variety that we have some kind of a married uh, um, collection of old and new. Isn't that how things often work? Okay, I'm gonna end with that, thanks.